Okay, yeah, so uh, welcome along uh, to the fifth and final night of the Who Hates the Meta Bhavana course. So th tonight we're going to do something a little bit different, or that at least the program would be a bit different. Um, so we'll start with meditation, and I'll say a little bit more about that. And what we're going to be focusing on this evening is the final stage of the Meta Bhavana, the stage where we develop love and kindness for all beings. So I'll say a little bit about that, and then we'll do some meditation. And then I just wanted to gather a little bit of uh, feedback on, um, yeah, just how you found the course, really. Um, I've not done this particular course online, so it'd be good to get your feedback. Um, and then we'll have, a, um, yeah, I think what, what I'll do then is I'll just say, well, um, just give you some ideas about some of the things that we're going to be doing in the new year in our online Buddha Center and things that you might want to participate in. So I'll talk about that. Um, people are often wondering on the last night of a course what they might do next in the way of another course or a retreat and so on. So I'll talk about that at that point. And then we'll finish again with another session of um, meditation. I wanted to talk about Tara. Um, Tara is an archetypal bodhisattva. So if you don't know what that is, I'll say a little bit more about that when we get there. And um, yeah, so we'll finish with Meta Bhavana, and then we'll just have a, a, an opportunity before we depart, just to ch um, touch back in with our breakout rooms and say a little bit about how we've found the course and say a little bit about what it is that we've learned on the course that we want to carry forward um, into uh, our lives and into the new year. So that's a basic plan for the, for the course. Um, for this evening, rather. So, um, yeah, this time of year is a very um, particular time of year. Um, it's a time of year when, in a way, we start to disengage with the different tasks that we're usually engaged in. So the different projects of life, work, um, all of the things that, yeah, that occupy us day to day, we begin to put down Probably for most of us, we've not put them down yet, but in the next few day, few days, maybe the next week or so, hopefully most of us will be able to put them down and to have some time just to kind of rest, really, and to um, reflect. So it's quite of a natural time of the year to reflect. And when we put down all the different things that we've been engaged in, uh, when we put down all our different activities, what we begin to experience a bit more vividly, I think, are the connections that we have with other people. Um, so I think that's part of the reason why it's natural at this time of year to send cards, to send gifts and greetings um, to our friends and family and, and make connections with them. Obviously, at this, this time, it's a bit more difficult to do that in a natural way. Um, we're often we're doing that um, online. Um, uh, but yeah, but there's still that, the point I'm making is there's still that kind of desire and that need and that tradition of, of reaching out to other people at this time. And another thing that we do at this time of year is there's stories that um, that we can touch into that express something of the significance of the particular time of year. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of traditional stories that we that we hear at this time of year. So, you know, I'm thinking of things like Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, um, you know, uh, it's a wonderful life. The the film, you know, those kinds of things. They they say something about um, connection and connectedness and the importance of that. And the importance, well, of course, you know, a Christmas Carol is all about the importance of generosity. So one of the stories that um, I particularly love, and I, I've not known this my whole life, but um, maybe in the last ten or twelve, fifteen years, I've come across it, which is the story. Um, by James Joyce called The Dead. So many of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with it. It's uh, the last story in a collection called Dubliners, which came out, I think, in 1914 or there or thereabouts. So about, um, well, about 100 years ago. And uh, the story um, tells this tale of, of a dinner party. And uh, it's a dinner party that happens on the, the Feast of Epiphany, which... Um, I think it's the last of the 12 days of Christmas. I can't remember exactly, but um, anyway, it's a tradition in this household um, that friends and family are invited around for a, a sort of a special um, winter uh, meal and there's dancing and there's music and there's a speech. 
and the story tracks this character called uh, Gabe, um, Gabriel and um, Gabriel is the one who's to give the speech at the party and uh, his wife features in, in a big way as well Greta and there's a host of other characters as well and uh, anyway it starts um, it starts with that and the, the dinner party and various different events and different conversations happen. Gabriel gives his speech and then one by one the, the guests depart the party and they go their separate ways and Greta and Gabriel uh, return to their hotel to the Gresham on O'Connell Street in a horse and carriage. And um, the last scene of the, the story is Gabriel and Greta in the hotel room and um, Greta's just remembered um, very vividly a boy that she loved um, when she was much, much younger, um, a girl really, and uh, this boy died. The boy is Michael Fury and uh, she's kind of reliving this loss really and Gabriel, her, her husband, is, is, is witnessing her and he has a series of reflections. So. I just wanted to bring this in um, at this point in the course and also because of the time of year. So what I want to do is just read the last um, couple of sections from The Dead and then I'll just make a little, um, I'll make a few comments about it and how it relates to Meta Bhavana. So if you imagine Gabriel in the hotel room in the Gresham and um, looking out of the window and his wife um, having fallen asleep after weeping because of this loss that, sh that she experienced earlier in her life. A few light taps upon the pane made him turn to the window. It had begun to snow again. He watched sleepily the flakes, silver and dark, falling obliquely against the lamplight. The time had come for him to set out on his journey westward. Yes, the newspapers were right. Snow was general all over Ireland. It was falling on every part of the dark central plain, on the treeless hills, falling softly upon the bog of Ullen, and further westward, softly falling into the dark, mutinous Shannon waves. It was falling too upon every part of the lonely churchyard on the hill where Michael Fury lay buried. It lay thickly drifted on the crooked crosses and headstones, on the spears of the little gate, on the barren thorns. His soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe, and faintly falling like the descent of their last end upon all the living and the dead. So, uh, I always, uh, it always, I've, I find that really touching the story, um, and uh, I think one of the things I wanted to draw out in it, and I think this is where it's analogous to the Meta Bhavana, is it starts with the particular. So the beginning of the story is very particular. It's a very particular scene, very particular people that are uh, evoked uh, very vividly. Um, so you're right there in that party in that particular part of Dublin with those people. And then towards the end of the story, it starts moving from the particular um, to the universal. And there's a particularly important aspect of the story where there's this love that's evoked and this loss that's evoked. Um, and and the reflections kind of spin out from Gabriel's witnessing of, of his wife reliving this grief. There's a, there's a lot more going on than that. But the, that, that particular aspect of something that moves from the particular to the universal, I think, is really central um, to the story. And it's also central to the Meta Bhavana. So as I was saying earlier, this evening we're going to be looking at the final stage. And that's what's happening in the final stage. In the final stage, we're having um, developed Meta for a number of different individuals. So yourself, uh, your friend, the neutral person and the difficult person and then holding all four, it begins to kind of move outwards um, and you're encouraging the practice to develop meta for the whole universe. Um, in the same way that the snow falls all over Ireland, there's something about the snow falling uh, which suggests something um, universal, that the snow is falling everywhere. The snow is general all over Ireland. 
um, in all the different places, on the churchyard and on the living and on the dead. Um, so in the Metta Sutta, which is a traditional Buddhist text, a very ancient Buddhist text, where the Buddha evokes the quality of Metta, um, he actually says, as strongly as a mother, perhaps risking her life, cherishes her child, her only child, develop an unlimited heart for all beings. So it's as if you're taking that particular love, that particular affection and care and nurture that a mother has for her child, and then expanding that to include all beings. Yeah, so again, it's moving from the particular to the universal. And then the text goes on to say, the meta sort of that is, develop an unlimited heart of friendliness for the entire universe, sending metta above, below, and all around, beyond all narrowness, beyond all rivalry, beyond all hatred. Um, so again, there's um, the sense of something universal. Sometimes it says develop an unlimited heart of friendliness for the entire cosmos. So something kind of cosmic is happening um, that you're kind of plugging into um, a sense of, a connection with, a feeling for, not just some living beings, but all living beings, and somehow holding them in your heart. So it's a bit it's a bit cosmic, the last stage of the Metta Bhavna, um, and there's a, there's a potential to awaken yet yeah, a sort of cosmic sense of the mystery of the world we live in with life and with death. So again, Metta helps us to develop a heart that can hold all of that, hold all the complexity of human life, hold the fact of um, birth, of renewal, and um, hold the fact of ending and death and um, hold the fact of joy and delight and happiness and hold the fact of sorrow and grief and uh, loss. So that's what we're aiming um, to develop. And again, I think the snow, the falling of the snow suggests something um, kind of uh, transformational or almost a transmutation. So where I'm from, it doesn't snow. Uh, and the, the sort of the town I'm from in the north of New Zealand, it never snows. So coming to this part of the world, one of the the extra sort of delights of it is being in the snow. So actually, I had been in snow when I was a kid, but I'd never been in snow when it was falling. So there's something very particular about that. And what I've noticed is about snow is when it snows, the atmosphere completely changes, it's completely transformed, which I think is one of the most magical things about snow and why we kind of love it. I know it's inconvenient and causes all kinds of hassles, but just when you're in it and you don't have to be anywhere or do anything, it can be really, really beautiful. And yeah, like I say, I think part of the reason for that is it, is it completely changes the atmosphere. So it completely changes the way things look, um, obviously. So everything is shrouded in white. Um, so the streets look different, the parks look different, the buildings look different, the, the landscape looks different, um, different colours come into the light, and it sounds different as well. The, the, the snow kind of muffles um, sound. Um, so yeah, again, everything in terms of the auditory sense is, is transformed. There's even a subtle smell, a subtle kind of odour that you get. Um, when it snows. So snow, yeah, when it snows, it sort of transforms completely the environment. And metta is like that as well. Um, so again, this is something I wanted to draw out of the story that when metta is present in our mind, in our heart, we actually see something quite different. We see a different kind of world. It transmutes our um, perceptions. It transmutes the way we relate to what we see as well as what we see. Um, so again, I think this is suggested really strongly by the um, by the story of the dead. So what I want to do is just, um, uh, well, let's just lead us through a Metta Bhavana with this kind of idea of um, moving from the uni the particular to the universal and the, 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 yeah, the transformative um, character of Metta, the way it transforms our perception of where we are and what we're doing and who we are even. So if you'd just like to set yourself up for meditation, and uh, we'll, we'll do some.
So what are the other characteristics or one of the other things that falling snow suggests is something incremental. So it doesn't happen all at once, but gradually, flake by flake, uh, snowdrifts begin to emerge. So metta is a little bit like that. It's just through the, the drops of intention, the snowflakes of well-wishing, the momentum of metta begins to gather. And we can begin that by simply beginning to pay attention to what's going on. Paying attention to what's there around us and within us. So firstly, just getting a sense of your surroundings. Getting a sense of the atmosphere of the place where you are. And noticing the bodily sessions that are present, that, that are arising in your body. Curious. And with a, an attitude of concern and care for yourself, just beginning to notice, for example, the touch of your body on what you're sitting on. Feeling the touch of your skin on your clothing. And if you're very distracted, if there's a lot going on in your mind, don't worry about that. In a way, at this time of year, a lot of us have got a lot going on. So it's quite natural then, if we've got a lot going on, that there'll be a lot flooding through our mind. So just being with that, if that's a reality for you. Just acknowledging that maybe we won't be as concentrated as we might be. And that's okay. We just work with whatever we work with.
and paying particular attention to the area around the heart. You could even imagine awareness like snow falling within your own mind. Awareness, which is the most powerfully transforming agent that we know. Not just awareness, but love as well. And to begin with, we're developing love for ourself. So over the course of the five weeks, we've looked at different ways of developing metta for yourself. So I'll just let you get on with that in whatever way feels appropriate for you. So firstly, metta for yourself. So checking that on the one hand, you're not being too forceful or on the other, that you're not being too vague.
Then bringing to mind a good friend. If it's appropriate, you might like to bring to mind somebody who you know is having a difficult time or somebody who's got some reason to celebrate. Or you might like to choose a friend who just comes into your mind for some reason. And notice how it is to have them there. Notice how it is to sit with your friend, what the feelings are. Remembering that there's no correct way. We just respond to whatever arises with kindness. So again, you can engage with the development of Meta in a way that you wish. So 
So we're gathering your attention around the heart again. Tuning into how you are. And bring into mind a neutral person. And then cultivating meta for that neutral person in whatever way, making sure that there is a particular way that you're engaging with meta for that particular person, their particular life. And then bring into mind someone that you find difficult. So working with that stage might be simply a matter of being with that discomfort that you experience or that painful feeling tone together with an awareness of that person as a person, of the fact that they exist from their side.
So what's happening now? Where is your attention? Where is your heart? Moving now into the fifth and final stage, beginning by giving your attention to each of those people, the four people, particular individuals and their particular lives. So there's yourself, metta, well-wishing, love for yourself. Love for your friend. Love for the neutral person. And the difficult person. So we're relating to them on the basis of what's most fundamental, which is our desire for well-being, happiness, freedom, and growth. And then moving outwards to more particular people. There's your intimate circle of family, of friends. So just allowing people to come into your mind of metta. And actually one at a time or in groups. And moving now from the particular to something more universal, so having a sense of a feeling for being knitted into the fabric of life. So beings in 
all directions, arising in different ways. His soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe, and faintly falling like the descent of their last end upon all the living and the dead. So meta for beings who have passed away, and meta for beings who are yet to be born. As strongly as a mother, perhaps risking her life, cherishes her child, her only child, develop an unlimited heart for all beings. Develop an unlimited heart of friendliness for the entire universe, sending matter above, below, and all around, beyond all narrowness, beyond all rivalry beyond all hatred. And then just sitting, so just sitting.
So Sam's just pointed out another reference to uh, <laughs> the dead, which I didn't know about until earlier, but it appears from Father Ted. Um, so someone has to tell me to shut the fuck up. <laughs> um, just um, what I wanted to do ne- to do now. Uh, okay, so welcome back. Um, yeah, wh- what I wanted to do. Thanks for your all your comments right now. Uh, by the way, I haven't had a chance to read them, but um, it's so valuable to get your comments. So um, yeah, this thanks again for for sending them into us. Um, and um, yeah, if you want to, by the way, if you didn't get a chance to write write in for for whatever reason um, in the break there, you, you could um, write in after the the course. I'll I'll be around for fifteen minutes at the end. Um, also, you could email us if you've got particular comments. We'd be really grateful to hear from you. And a- actually, if they're qu- critical, that's actually really really helpful to hear them. I'd rather hear them than not hear them. So don't be afraid of being critical. Um, critical feedbacks really really helpful. Um, so, um, yeah, because we've just been doing a meta course, um, you know, I won't take it personally. Uh, so I wanted to say a few things just about, um, where to go from here. So we've been doing a course for five weeks. We've been looking at meta bhavana and, um, yeah, it's, it's been not just about the meditation, but about gathering together every week and talking to each other, communicating with each other and hearing a little bit more, getting some perspectives. So um, that's all been that's all been part of the part of the course. Um, so I wanted to just give you a, some sort of sense of what else you can do in the coming time just to keep the momentum up. Um, so um, it's really, really important to just keep the momentum going with meditation um, because our lives are our actions. Um, we have to keep engaging with these things if we want to keep enjoying the benefits. Um, we have to keep actually endeavouring to strive towards de- developing meta. If we want it to be part of our lives, it won't just kind of happen that the momentum will peter out if we don't actually keep making an effort um, to engage. Obviously, we're making an effort in a in a skillful and appropriate and a balanced way. But yeah, we we do we we, we need to keep that effort going. So the, the one of the what I usually would do um, at the end of a course is, is encourage you really really strongly to go to go on retreat, and that would involve going into the countryside and being with some people uh, for a weekend or a week. And uh, I'm not going to encourage you to do that um, at least to go away for a weekend or a week. What I'm going to co- encourage you to do is go and retreat with us in your home. Uh, for a week so we've got a a, well at least for six days so immediately after well not quite immediately after but just after Christmas on the starting on the 27th of December we've got a winter retreat happening and what we'll be doing is trying to replicate as best we can the the conditions um, for a retreat um, so that people can engage with a retreat at home Uh, for obvious reasons we can't be together and um, we've got a really exciting um, team. Um, one of the wonderful things about Zoom um, is that you can gather in people from all over the place. So uh, I'm part of the True Ratna Buddhist Order, and there's about 17, 18, 19, 20 of us. Um, I'm not sure of the exact number in Ireland. And um, we've got a whole team of about, I think there's about nine or 12 of us who are going to be um, communicating the Dharma in different ways throughout the course of the retreat. And um, you'll get a chance to hear different voices and people communicating from a slightly different life experience, from a slightly different perspective, and just with their own character um, shining forth. There's going to, be a, going to be a theme for the retreat. The particular theme is around this character, Padma Sambhava, who was instrumental in establishing Buddhism in Tibet in, in and around the 8th century. So he's... A character who is um, shrouded in legend and symbol um, and in story. So a lot of what we're going to be doing is evoking his life and in a way the spiritual uh, transformative force that he embodies through symbol and through story and through myth. Uh, so I, it's one of the things about looking into a computer screen or a television screen um, 
for a lot of the day is it's somehow I feel it has a sort of slightly deadening effect on our imagination. So this retreat is all about awakening the imagination and being with other people in, in, in that kind of way. So I'm really looking forward to just exploring uh, what it's like to be on retreat with others in a virtual way um, for six days. And I'd really encourage you to come along um, for all of it. It'd be great if you could be there for the whole retreat. Um, but uh, you'd be really welcome to dip in and out of it as well. We're, we're aware of the fact that because we'll, we're going to be most of us in our homes, there'll be other things going on. So you can dip into the retreat if you wish. You can come to um, the morning meditations or the talks or whichever parts of it you wish. So that's possible too. There'll be another shorter retreat, a weekend retreat sometime in February, which we'll let you know about. So I just really wanted to encourage you to think about coming on the, the winter retreat and really making the most. I was saying earlier um, how this time of the year has a very particular kind of feel to it. And it's quite natural to kind of turn inwards and be reflective. And really what you're doing when, when you go on retreat, um, you know, at, after Christmas and before the year started, is you're able to really make the most of that natural, reflective, internal kind of atmosphere that arises in the mind. So yeah, so I'd really encourage you to think about that. Um, I mean, the great thing is actually, you can just try it out. There's no, you know, you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to pay any money. Um, we will be asking for donations, but it's an opportunity just to try it out. You don't, you know, it's, it's nothing, nothing to lose as it were. The other thing I wanted to, well, there's a, there's a two other main things I wanted to mention. And one is the 21 day meditation challenge. So this is something that we're doing in collaboration with the London Buddha Center, which is our true Ratna center in London. It's based in the, in the East, uh, East end of London. And they're doing this thing with, in collaboration with a number of Buddha centers, actually in the UK and Ireland, um, the 21 day meditation challenge. And what that's about is really getting the year off to a flying start in terms of meditation. So that the, the, the challenge is to meditate every day for 21 days and six days of the seven, there's going to be sessions that are, um, are taught by some of the best um, teachers that we have in our movement, actually, and um, that are based at the London Buddha Centre talking about meditation. Um, so it's a really unique opportunity to, to, like I say, just to really get the year off to a flying start with meditation. We'll also be, be doing our own local Irish session on a, on a Wednesday night. So there'd be, um, there'd be the whole range of different events, particularly meditation in the morning, meditation input, both for beginners and for regulars. So you'd be in the regular bracket. But if you know people who'd like to learn to meditate, it'd be a really good opportunity. There'll be also sessions, um, I think it's on Monday evening. Um, and also on Wednesday, like I said. So that's starting on the 9th of January for 21 days. I think the 21 days actually starts from the 11th. Uh, we've also got um, a course starting after that, which is um, a course I'll be teaching on a Tuesday night, and it's, um, it's called Vision and Transformation. And it's exploring this idea that Buddhism really is about having a particular vision of what we can become, and then transforming the whole rest of our life in accordance with that vision. So that's the kind of idea that lies behind the Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path, which is one of the, the key uh, teachings of the Buddha, really. It's one of the most central and well-known teachings of the Buddha, the Eightfold Path. So we're going to be exploring what that means, both in theory, but also in practice over the course of the eight weeks. So it'll be something similar to what we've been doing on these Tuesday night courses um, this year, and we're going to be continuing that. And... Um, yeah, so that's, there's a lot of other things happening besides, but I just wanted to highlight, yeah, that the winter retreat, the 21 day meditation challenge and the vision and transformation course. And we'll, we'll send you details in the email tomorrow about those courses, if, it's, if you wish to book on. Um, and of course, just to remind you about our um, social media. So we're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And if you search Dublin Buddha Center, um, you can find us and you can, um, subscribe or whatever you want to and yeah so I, I just wanted to mention um, yeah just it's important to have a sense of what you might do next particularly when the the value of what you've engaged with is fresh in your mind so yeah so I was talking earlier about um, in a way how when we do meta we develop a kind of a new kind of mind um, and I was using the analogy of snow falling and the transformation that takes place when snow falls um, 
to the way meta, when our mind is infused with meta, it changes the kind of world we live in and it changes the kind of person we are. We see things differently, we see things more truly and we see things more beautifully. We're more genuinely responsive um, to others. And <clears throat> in a way, what we're, what we're beginning to approach is the mind of a Buddha. Uh, so yes, yeah, so, that, so you know, we, as we heard in the Metta Sutta, um, you know, we, we endeavor to develop an unlimited heart of friendliness for the entire universe, sending matter above, below, and all around, beyond all narrowness, beyond all rivalry, beyond all hatred. So when we're doing the Metta Bhavana, that's like an aspiration. That's something we're trying to cultivate. And it's something we can cultivate according to the Buddhist tradition. That's what the Buddha does. That's what is in his mind. Um, you see in this image behind me here, um, how the Buddha is, is surrounded by this aura, um, a sambra, and in a way that aura is expressive of his goodwill, you could say. It's like a, a sort of a field of uh, goodwill. I mean, that goodwill's too weak, um, but there's no word that can really contain or capture um, this at the heart of the, or the mind of a Buddha. Um, but that's really what the Buddha embodies. And if we're doing the practice, um, with that kind of idea in mind that that is a possibility not just for the Buddha but also for us, it greatly kind of amplifies our sense of, of particularly of the last stage of the practice. And I wanted to bring this in because I think it can it can bring in this dimension of that meta is something that is in a way a waking up to what's really there, that when we let go of, of things needing to be about us, when we let go of this idea that we're the center of every, everything, then this new kind of consciousness emerges. Um, and again, that's a half years ago in India embodied that. Um, but it also in the Buddhist tradition, that kind of mind, that kind of heart is expressed in terms of images. Um, and it's expressed um, in, in one particular image, which I wanted to share with you. And it's an image of a figure called Tara. Um, Tara is a bodhisattva which means she's a being dedicated to the welfare of all living beings. Um, and her body is made of green light, if you can imagine such a thing. And she appears as a 16-year-old youth, um, kind of in the prime of her beauty. And she represents compassion. And not just ordinary compassion, but fearless compassion. So because she's not identified with anything, because she's not holding on to anything, she knows there's nothing she can lose and therefore she's utterly fearless. Um, and again, this is a, a quality I think that we can begin to approach more and more when we do the Metta Bhavna, that it actually makes us more confident um, when, when we're not frightened of our own mind um, and what it can do, then it gives us in a way unshakable confidence. So I wanted to just show you, um, I'll share this on screen, an image of, of Tara. So hopefully you can see her there. Um, you can see the fact that she's seated in the sky on a lotus. Um, hopefully you can see the fact that one of her feet kind of comes down, which su suggests that she's stepping down into the world um, out of compassion. And then in her hands, she holds these sprays of blue lotus flowers. And the, the buds of the lotus flowers are in different stages of development. Um, so there's a, a, a tight bud, a half open bud, and then a fully bloomed lotus. And again, this suggests growth. It suggests that when we do practices like the Metta Bhavna, our human um, the, our capacities begin to, to begin to ripen, begin to bear fruit even. And uh, that's what the lotuses uh, represent. Um, you can't probably, can't. I don't know if I can zoom in on this. I don't think I can. Let's see. Oh, I can. Look at that. You can see there on her, um, uh, hopefully, you can, oh, there we go. You can see that, oh, that's better. <laughs> you can see that on her left hand, um, she's holding the lotus. And she's holding um, the lotus between her ring finger and her thumb, like kind of something like that. And uh, her other three fingers are extended. And the, fr the, th the three fingers that are extended represent the three jewels the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And it's because she's got unshakable faith in the three jewels that she has this fearlessness. Um, that is the, sort of the basis of her compassionate mind, her compassionate activity. 
So as well as appearing in a particular way, this green goddess with a green color, uh, she also has a sound. So she, her qualities are expressed in a sound. And that comes down to us as a mantra. And her mantra is Um Tare Tutare Ture Swaha. Um Tare Tutare Ture Swaha. And um, that means, in a way, it's just a play on her name, Tara. Tara means something, well, Tara literally means star, and it also means saviour or saviouress. So she delivers us from fear. Uh, and of course, ultimately, what that means is she delivers us when we, when we ourselves have developed the kind of mind that she has. That, that's how she delivers us. It's not some kind of, um, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't sort of, take our sins away in, in that kind of way, if you see what I mean. So yeah, so that's Tara. And what I thought we could do is just actually meditate a little bit and just re um, connect with that sense of the last stage of the practice. And I'll just begin the chanting of the mantra. And if you want to join in, you can. And just in that way, kind of get a sense of something a bit cosmic, um, even a cosmic kind of being, which is what emerges uh, when we let go of everything needing to be about me. Yeah. So I'll actually, I'll leave her there as we meditate. So if you want to, you can have a look. So again, if you want to um, set yourself up for meditation. And particularly connecting with a sense of the space around you. Your body resting on your chair. and feeling, noticing the inner experience. So what's going on in the heart? Do you feel spacious or contracted or just noticing the, the kind of quality of the, the mind of the heart? And so whatever happens in our meditation, whatever happens in our life, our sense of all the other beings that are in the world also arises in the context of the possibility for growth, for a profound shift in consciousness, a profound shift in awareness, where we no longer exclusively identify everything in relation to ourself.
So that possibility, that possibility of growth, of the emergence of something transcendent, is part of the wider context of our life. That's what is represented by the lotus buds and the open flower, the open blossoms of lotuses that Tara holds in her hands. So with that in mind, we can enter into the first stage of the Metabhavana. And then moving into the good friend stage, what I suggest you do is choose the person that you chose earlier. So meta for a good friend.
and then bring into mind a neutral person, the same person as earlier, and including them in your meta. And just thinking of them and evoking their presence and letting that momentum of meta continue might be all that you need to do. the meta for a difficult person.
And then bringing each of the four people to mind. So equalizing or universalizing our meta. And then allowing Meta to radiate from there. And I'm going to start in a moment the chanting of the Green Tara Mantra, which is the sound of fearless compassion. And if you want to join in, by all means do so, or you could just listen. Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Swaha 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 Om 
Tare to Tare to Re Swaha Om Tare to Tare to Re Swaha Om Tare to Tare to Re Swaha Om Tare to Tare to Re Swaha So um, that was Green Tara. And what we'll do now is we'll have a chance to just say what our intention is, what we'd like to carry um, forward from our practice, what we'd like to do next, um, and anything we'd like to say about the course. We won't have as long as we normally have um, in the groups, so you need to be a little bit more concise. So Daniel, if you could set the groups going for 10 minutes, and um, we'll start those when you're ready. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I just wanted to say, well, just a, just a, just thank you, really. Um, I wanted to thank um, Daniel. He's been working behind the scenes, setting, particularly setting up the groups, which is actually quite tricky to get the same people on each group every night. is quite a um, a tricky thing to do. And um, also want to thank, um, yeah, so just thanks thanks to Daniel and for sending all the emails and all the work in between the scenes, make, looking after the booking form. There's quite a bit that goes on behind the scenes to make sure that everyone gets in, into the same place and gets the notes the following day. He's also been editing the video, so he's been doing a lot behind the scenes. Also want to thank Katie, who stepped in for him um, one week. So thanks, Katie, as she's there somewhere. Um, and yeah, I wanted to thank you all for coming along, actually. Um, I've been really delighted. Um, the little group I've had... Um, it's just been lovely just to see people see people really engage with it and really um, get the benefit from it. So it's really gratifying just to see that happening. So um, I just wanted to thank you all for for coming and not just coming once, but coming every week. And I know some of you have been catching up with the videos um, in between if you've not been able to make a session. So all the videos will be online, um, so you can plug into them anytime you like. The the the, the playlist will be there on our um, Dublin Buddha Centre YouTube channel. Um, and um, yeah, so and I also wanted to thank you for your donations. So, um, as I've been saying, we've been doing everything um, since March, we've been doing absolutely everything at the Dublin Buddha Centre on a donation basis. And I'm so grateful to everybody for just playing along with that because it's, it's actually worked out for us quite well. We're, we're, we're okay, we're in, a, we're in an okay situation financially, which is a real relief because, it, you know, as we all know, it's a difficult time um for everybody um so um and yeah you know you've got a bit of a sense of of what we do at the buddha center i mean we've, we've we try it there's a lot more we could do if we could meet in person we can have retreats and we could actually talk to each other you know face to face and all that um so you've got a bit of a sense of of what we do if you would like to continue to support the work that we do um and there's a lot more that we could do if we had more resources financial resources in particular we could have a bigger team we could get a bigger center we'd love to get a bigger center and we're also looking around for in the pot in the future for getting our own retreat center so that we've got a place that belongs to us that we, we can go and retreat so we're really looking to um to, to develop what we're doing so if you would like to to, to support us um to say thanks for the course or or, or or just to help us keep doing what we're doing then um you can give us a donation and that would be really um we'd be really grateful for that one thing you can do as well, if, if you want to support us more ongoingly and help us to develop the kind of financial stability and security um, that, that we need to really grow, you can give us a, a monthly um, standing order. That makes a huge difference, actually, to, just in order to move forward confidently into the future. So, yeah, so I just leave you with that thought. And um, just, yeah, thanks very much for coming. And it's been, I've really enjoyed it actually seeing you every week. 
and um, I'll be hanging around afterwards if you want to um, ask any questions or anything. But other than that, I, I hope to see you at another course and one day, maybe in the flesh, if I haven't met you before, or even if I have. So yeah, it's been great. And um, just wish you all the best for the the um, the end of the, the end of year and um, the solstice festive season and and yeah for the new year. Let's hope it's a it's a happier, brighter year than this year has been. <laughs> okay, see you later.